My name is uh, Ben Kemp. I'm the operations manager here with uh, the Friends of Grant Cottage. Um, and it's wonderful to see you all out today on this beautiful um, Saturday in uh, the fall. Uh, I'll certainly take this type of weather for the rest of the fall if it'll, if it'll give it to us. Um, so, but of course, it's, a, it's also a special day because today uh, is International Peace Day. So that's what our program is going to be about today, uh, specifically uh, about Ulysses S. Grant and his relationship uh, with peace um, and trying to achieve peace. Um, so today, as I mentioned, is an important day uh, worldwide. Uh, because today is International Peace Day, which was established almost 40 years ago by the United Nations. Um, and it's a, really a day dedicated to world peace uh, and the avoidance of war and conflict of any kind, violence of any kind, really, even societal violence. Um, and, and so that's the, the aim of it, to, to focus a single day uh, for recognition, for thought, and for you know, recognition of efforts in that to achieve um, world peace. What is peace? Uh, peace is defined as a state of harmony and the absence of conflict. Uh, on a personal level, it can be, uh, mean the absence of fear and the peace of mind. Unfortunately, many in this world do wake up every day with no guarantee of peace. The fear of violence is constantly uh, on their minds. So the next question is where does peace begin? Where does it originate? I think most would agree that peace originates in the hearts and minds of people. That we all hold the potential to be peaceful people. And I think these realities were all known to that soldier named Ulysses Grant. And he grasped these realities and he lived by them. The fact that a man who encountered the inhumanities of war that could easily turn something, someone into a cynical, cold, and uncaring person, was able to maintain his sensitive, caring nature. It's a testament to inner peace. It was a, there was a powerful reality that Grant was going to have to face head on, and that's the division works against peace and unity. Ulysses S. Grant, like most Americans in the 19th century in the antebellum, watched as slowly and painfully the country became divided. But Grant was not one to stand aside. When it came his time, even though he was a man who hated war, he would fight, but he would fight for peace. If we go back to Grant's childhood in Ohio, we have a boy growing up in a period of time in America where essentially the country was at peace. So he grew up in a peaceful time. Major sectional divisions and political conflicts were still under the surface. They had not surfaced uh, to the extreme that they would in later decades. And I think Grant, really, as he was growing up, he, he learned to be confident and self-possessed. And I think this, this confidence, and this self, you know, this centeredness that he had, he really gained from his mother. Uh, she was a devout Methodist. She had a strong faith. And she believed that things were just or unjust. There really wasn't, you know, a lot of in-between or gray area. And I think she pass this on to her son. And I think that's really where he was, that's why in later years, when he's trying to navigate war and strife to reestablish peace, it's this confidence in the justness of what he's doing and the rightness of what he's doing that really allows him to remain strong. Grant would end up spending most of his adult life actually preparing and training to deal with conflict. He was involved in the Mexican-American War in his 20s, the Civil War in his 40s, and the Native American conflicts in later years. 
Despite encountering so much war, division, and strife, he was still able to keep the hope of peace alive in his heart. And we see that in different statements he's going to make. And I'm going to share some of these personal statements that Grant made in letters and in public statements to the public, to the American public, showing that he was truly, underneath it all, a man of peace. You get the caricature of Grant, the tough guy, stern face, you know, cigar chomping, tough guy general. That's what you get from an image of Grant, but Grant was a very sensitive man. We, we go over that here at Grant Cottage, how much of a caring, loving family man he was. And that's just a glimpse into Grant's personal nature. And that's important. His sensitiveness really is important when it comes to focusing on peace and, and trying to work towards it. The hope of peace in Grant's heart was a candle in the darkness of the times that he lived in. It was noticed by everyone. There's many accounts of Grant's acts of compassion, especially to his foes. So his enemies even recognized on multiple occasions, and we'll go over a couple of those. I think Grant first encountered what he referred to as the unjustness of war in Mexico in the 1840s. As a young lieutenant, he would first see firsthand how war affected not only the soldiers engaged in the conflict, but the civilians of the country as well. At a time when many looked down on other cultures as inferior, Grant developed a deep appreciation and compassion for the Mexican people, and it would last through the rest of his life. Some of his final visitors here at the cottage would be Mexican journalists. And he wore himself down talking to them, giving them time in his weak condition, just showing how much he cared. And the statements he made showed how much he cared for the Mexican people. It would be in Mexico that Grant would realize the terrible truth that the vigorous pursuit of victory in war was in fact the fastest way to peace. From camp at Matamoros, Mexico, Grant wrote his fiancée, Julia, in June 1846, I would not be surprised if the next letter I write you, dear love, should be written on the road from here to Monterey. We are very anxious to push forward, for that is our only hope of a speedy peace. Like many young, duty-bound soldiers, Grant desired nothing more than to return to a life of peace and the end of a painful separation from the one that his heart truly longed for. In November of 1846, Grant wrote Julie again. He said, so many battles must, of course, result in a final peace, and I hope matters will be rushed so as to bring about a speedy settlement to all our difficulties. By February of the next year, he wrote again to Julia, desperate to understand the public sentiment about the war. He said to Julie, what do the people in the United States think about peace? Do they think there ever will be peace again between the United States and Mexico? This is a man that's deeply troubled by the underpinnings of this war. He believed it was unjust. A stronger over a weak, weaker nation. He would reluctantly serve out the rest of the war until 1848 when a peace was established, but he was a changed man. The inevitable effects of war had left him with scars only veterans understand. He had lost many friends and was robbed of years with the young woman that would become his bride. He now fully understood the consequences of war firsthand. While living in the South uh, in the 1850s, Grant's blood was chilled by the casual talk of secession. And he was as much dismayed about the Northerners and their radical views. He ended up voting for a Democrat in the 1856 election to prevent what he saw as impending secession and war. He stated at the time that he had hoped that the passions of the people would subside and the catastrophe be averted altogether. 
He held out hope that the Southerners would think well before they took the awful leap which they had so vehement, vehemently threatened. And I think you're seeing a couple of things here. I think you're seeing a man that sees the results of division. He sees that passions, when they outweigh reason, can turn into war. And he would do anything to avoid that. He also said the awful leap, because he had seen the awful leap in Mexico. He had seen the results of war. Grant ended up watching hopelessly, though, as those that would not take part in the conflict created the most division from politicians to the press. It really broke Grant's heart when the country dissolved before his eyes and forced him into the most unsavory of duties, war, to protect the nation he had sworn to serve. This is a man that went to West Point. This is a man that's trained by his country in the art of war. When his country goes to war, when it's threatened, even though he has truly a heart of peace, he is duty-bound. This is a man of, of deep conviction. He watched his own family become divided. His in-laws were slave-owning Southerners in, outside of St. Louis, Missouri. His father was a Northerner with abolitionist sentiments. And this, of course, secession and division divided the family even further. Many of the men he had gone to school with in West Point or fought with side by side in Mexico were going to be his enemies. Brother against brother, family against family, old friends as enemies. That's what war does. At his first major victory at Fort Donelson, you start to see, this is in 1862, in early 1862, the war hasn't been going on that long, but long enough for people to start to realize this is not going to be a 90-day war. This is going to be a longer war, and it's going to produce a lot more casualties. And Fort Donelson was a wake-up call. So Grant, he really showed his compassionate nature, but his, he showed his view towards the Southerners at this surrender. He forced the surrender of the fort. And then when he was asked about the formal surrender ceremony, this was still back in the days when you had formal surrenders, swords being handed over and supposedly chivalrous behavior of war. Grant said, why should we go with such forms and mortify and injure the spirit of brave men who, and this is very important, after all, are our own countrymen. That's important. This is how Grant views his enemy. He doesn't view them as some ambiguous enemy with no face, with no name, with no worth or value. He sees them as Americans. He's fighting Americans. And that's going to be important in the way that he reacts, and the way that he plans his battles, and the way that he deals with the surrendered Confederates in the future. <laughs> Passing over this fresh battlefield at Fort Donelson, Grant and his staff encountered a wounded Union and Confederate soldier side by side. The Union soldier was trying to give the Confederate soldier a drink from his canteen, but was not able to do so in his condition. Grant dismounted his horse, asked for a flask, and gave each man a shot of brandy and ordered stretchers to take them off. When he noticed that the hospital stewards were only caring for the Union man, Grant said, take the Confederate too. The war is over between them. He found it difficult to deal with the realities of war, the, the blood and the gore and the terror of war. And as he's moving through this battlefield, the, the aftermath of this battle, he said to his staff, let's get away from this dreadful place. I suppose this work is part of the devil that is left in us all. He then whispered the following Robert Burns verses, man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands to mourn. 
I think Grant is realizing that in that statement, he's realizing we have the capacity to be peaceful people, but we also have a terrible capacity to be, to ca capacity to be inhumane to each other. After the shockingly bloody Battle of Shiloh, later in the spring of 1862, Grant endured a torrent of negative press that threatened his military position. And he learned quickly, because this is his first time really engaged with the press during wartime, that the press themselves can, be, can serve to unite or to divide. And in this case, they were inflaming the, inflaming the passions that had already contributed to the division that was causing this war. General Sherman wrote to Grant in the same vein in the spring of 62. He said, there is a power in our land, irresponsible, corrupt, and malicious, the press, which has created the intense feelings of hostility that has arrayed the two parts of our country against each other, which must be curbed and brought within the just limits of reason and law before we can have peace in America. Grant really looked to Sherman for advice, and Sherman had quite a perspective, quite a strong pers perspective, if anybody knows Sherman. Uh, but certainly, um, what he's saying here is true, though. We all know this. It's still true today that the press can be uh, a force of good or it can be a force of division. Until the end of 1862, there was still, politicians in the North were still holding out hope that they could turn states back to the Union. There was this, this, this hope that you know, communities had enough union supporters in the South that they could flip entire regions, maybe entire states. Um, everybody knows this maybe the situation with West Virginia. So there, there, was, there was hope that by turning some of these states, but by the end of the year, it was clear that that was not going to happen. There was not going to be, a, the, the idea of a negotiated peace was fading. He recognized the stubborn determination of his foe could only be dealt with in one way. Just like he had seen in Mexico, he wrote to his commanding officer Halleck, General Halleck, in March of 63, There is now no possible hope of a reconciliation with the rebels. The Union Party in the South is virtually destroyed. There can be no peace but that which is enforced by the sword. We must conquer the rebels or be conquered by them. It was black and white. He, did, he was not spewing hatred. He was just stating the obvious. How can we attain peace in the quickest way? The common vein in everything Grant did during the war was to bring about peace as quickly as he could. That was his one guiding principle. To save as many lives and to end war as quickly as possible, which goes together. The war had made it clear that there was no going back. The issue that had sparked the war must be settled to have a hope of peace. He wrote to Congressman Elihu Washburn in August of 63, as anxious as, as I am to see peace reestablished, I would not therefore be willing to see any settlement until this slavery question is forever settled. So to have this simmering issue come out the other end of the war, he saw it as something that would just create war again in the future. So there's things that have to be moved past. As Grant tra traveled through enemy territory in his Vicksburg campaign, he instructed his soldiers to take only what they needed create as favorable an impression as possible on the people. He watched as Vicksburg fell and I think he saw these bits of humanity in this inhumane war. He, he saw the men taking bread from their haversacks and giving it to the enemy. They had so recently been engaged in starving out. 
these incidents must have helped Grant hold on to the ultimate faith in humanity that he held out to the end of the war. After his victory at Chattanooga in late 1863, Grant showed his regard for all soldiers suffering in the fight, and a Confederate prisoner recalled the scene as they were marching past. When General Grant reached the line of ragged, filthy, bloody, despairing prisoners, he lifted his hat and held it over his head until he passed the last man of that living funeral cortege. He was the only officer in that whole train who recognized us being on the face of the earth. Having a regard, having a, a, a seeing humanity in your enemy is something that Grant was able to do. By December, Grant's hope was at a high point. As he confidently wrote to his father, Jesse, he said, I feel that there be no apprehension, apprehension now, but that peace will be speedily restored and the Union stronger than ever saved. Despite this optimism, Grant knew coming east in 1864 that there would undoubtedly be one last bloody campaign. He, he wanted to try to avoid it, but he knew it probably wouldn't be avoidable. But by this time, he had learned the terrible math of war. Grant's staff member and close friend, Horace Porter, he explained that no one was more desirous of peace, no one was possessed of a heart more sensitive to every form of human suffering than Grant. But he realized that paper bullets are not effective in warfare. He knew better than to attempt to hew rocks with a razor. And he felt that in campaigning, the hardest, the hardest blows bring the quickest relief. He was aware that more men had died from sickness while lying in camp than from shot and shell in battle. And that's the most important point. Because it's easy to look at Grant's campaigns in 1864 and say, this man was a butcher. This man just pushed soldiers into a meat grinder to their death. Because on the surface, that's what it looks like. But if you extend out the mathematical, and Grant was a mathematician, if you pragmatically extend out the war, you see that Grant was doing the most terrible of math, sending tens of thousands of their men to, men to their death to save lives in the end. And he, out of all the generals that Lincoln had counted on, was willing to do this. He knew what had to be done. So the most compassionate course was to end the war under any circumstances. Biographer Gene Edward Smith, who just passed away on September 1st, described the resolute but compassionate general. Grant represented the calm at the center of the storm of battle. He accepted the reality of war and recognized that victory could not be achieved without fighting. And he never lost sight of the ultimate goal of the restoration of peace. Grant was ruthless in battle because he wanted to end the war as soon as possible. And when he did so, he was magnanimous and caring for those defeated. So after these casualty-ridden campaigns that dragged into the summer, Grant saw the upcoming presidential elections. And Northern Division and the people of the North and the war sentiment of the North as some of the only obstacles left. So it became a political game, and it became a game of public sentiment. He wrote to Congressman Washburn and his friend Dan Ammon in August of 64, he said, the South's only hope now is in a divided North. The rebellion is now fed by the bickering and differences in the North. The hope of a counter-revolution over the draft or the presidential election keeps them together. They hope the election of the peace candidate. Our peace friends, if they expect peace from separation, are much mistaken. It would be but the beginning of war. 
Now, if you know anything about the 1864 election, uh, General George McClellan was also involved, and he was a peace candidate, and there, I believe there was others too, but the idea was, let's make a peace with the South. Now, Grant did not believe that was possible. He did not believe that that would truly be peace, or it certainly would not be a lasting peace. It would simply be a truce until another state or another country tried to break. So there was a precedent being set here. And Grant knew that this division, the peace, uh, to break us into two countries, would have been a division. So it goes against the idea of unity being a grounds, the groundwork for peace. And I think Grant really um, saw that. He's, he's going to show his self-possession uh, by reassuring his wife in September uh, that a path to peace was, was, in fact, still possible. He said, I try to look at everything calmly, believe that I do. Therefore, I believe that all we want to produce, to produce a speedy peace is a unity of sentiment in the North. And again, he's, this unity of sentiment, he believes, is incredibly important to filling the ranks and ending this war. Sherman's victories in the South and Lincoln's re-election in November helped chase away that specter of a false peace settlement with the South. The lasting peace would now be settled on the battlefield. He wrote to Philadelphia dignitaries who purchased him a home there in January 1865. He shared his unshakable faith in the restoration of peace with the pre-sentiment. I will not predict a day when we will have peace again with the Union restored, but that 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 day will come is as sure as the rising of tomorrow's sun. I have never doubted this in the darkest days of this dark and terrible rebellion. That's important. He kept that flame of hope alive, that flame of hope and peace alive through everything that he encountered. By February, the discussions now turned on how to finish the war. Forgiveness and amnesty dominated Grant's position as a foundation for starting the process towards reconciliation. He wrote to Secretary of State Seward stating, would it not be well to let them see by an example, the Southerners, that those who freely and voluntarily, and voluntarily return to their allegiance will be forgiven and restored to their rights as citizens. I do not profess to be a judge of the best civil policy to pursue res uh, and restore peace and the integrity of the Union. My duty is to apply force to accomplish this end. He's saying they can come back already. It's the war's not even over. He said if they if they want to come back, we're going to accept them back. In February and March, the Confederacy tried a couple of times to to, to host peace talks, um, but Grant and Lincoln saw them for what they were. They there were desperate last ditch attempts at a, at what they looked at as a false peace. Grant clearly saw the Union cause as what he called the side of peace and had determined that the dissolution of the country desired by the Confederacy would only lead to perpetual war. And there was some reason to believe that. He had seen other empires and countries throughout history illustrate that fact. In late March, Lincoln visited with Grant, Sherman, and Admiral Porter on board the River Queen near City Point, Virginia, and they discussed the anticipated ending of the war. Lincoln made his position very clear. He wanted generous terms, allowing the Confederates to go back to their homes and work on their farms and in their shops. He knew they would be busy rebuilding, too busy rebuilding their lives to take up arms again. And it was best to just let them go, officers and all. I want submission and no more bloodshed. This is what Lincoln's telling them. I want no, no one punished. Treat them liberally all around. We want those people to return to their allegiance to the Union and submit to the laws. Lincoln would make a stop at a nearby hospital, visiting both Union and Confederate wounded in an act of impartial co compassion. This idea of letting the Confederates off easy, as most a lot of Northerners would, would, would say, um, was built on the foundation that 
if you seek retribution, you are just going to inflame the passions again, and these men are going to fly, fly to the hills and operate a guerrilla war for years, and more men will die, and peace will never be established uh, for many years. To General Grant or to General Lee, on the final campaign in the spring of 1865, he says to him, "Your note of last evening. They're they're exchanging letters about the the possible surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia." In reply, I would say that peace being my great desire, there is but one condition I insist upon, namely that the men and officers surrendered shall be disqualified for taking up arms again against the government of the United States until properly exchanged. And after a little bit of posturing by General Lee, he, uh, he added in a later note, I am equally anxious for peace with yourself, and the whole North entertains the same feeling. The terms upon which peace can be had are well understood. By the South laying down their arms, they will hasten that most desirable effect, save thousands of human lives and hundreds of millions of property not yet destroyed, sincerely hoping that all our difficulties may be settled without the loss of another life. So he would meet Lee with Lee at Appomattox, Palm Sunday. Lee had no idea what Grant may pose in his terms. And he was greatly relieved at these generous terms for a couple of reasons. Grant really followed the path prescribed by their Lincoln in their earlier meeting a few weeks before. Pursuing peace requires being sensitive to the needs of others. Grant knew most of the southern men faced difficult lives ahead. Rebuilding their lives. So his terms echoed Lincoln, Lincoln's magnanimous offer to have all the Confederate soldiers paroled with no punishment and the ability to take their horses home to work their farms. Lee realized the gravity of Grant's terms, stating, This will have the best possible effect upon the men. It will be very gratifying and will do much toward conciliating our people. The hungry, Confeder hungry Confederates desperately needed provisions, which Grant humanely offered to them. It was a new world dawning for America, and Grant chose to start it on a note of reconciliation and not retribution. After four long, bloody years, peace was finally in sight for America. Grant knew that the path to peace was paved, paved with healing and acceptance would not be finished overnight, but it could begin immediately. Grant's staff visited their old army friends, and Grant himself visited with his old friend James Longstreet ready to forgive all and pick up where they had left off. Grant would stop the celebratory salutes of his army and stated, the rebels are our countrymen again. Grant saw the positive effect of this on the Southerners and optimistically wrote soon after the surrender to Secretary of War Stanton, he said, if proper advantage is taken of the present feeling in the South, I am greatly in hopes that an early peace will be secured. You have to remember at this time, when he took this surrender of General Lee, there was still Confederate armies that had not surrendered yet. Sensitive to the dejected condition of the Southerners, Grant also, after being requested numerous times, refused to enter the conquered city of Richmond, Virginia, stating that his visit would only wound the feelings of the residents and we ought not to do anything at such a time which would add to their sorrow. Only days after the surrender, President Lincoln's assassination threatened the peaceful nature of the ending of the war. It once again inflamed passions, and there were cries for vengeance. Even Grant uncharacteristically overreacted, ordering the imprison imprisonment of Confederate officials and soldiers, only to remand it soon after. He wrote to Julia in the end of April from North Carolina, the realities of Reconstruction, and that there was no room for vengeance. He said, the people are anxious to see peace restored so that further devastation need not take place in the country. The suffering that must exist in the South the next year, even with the war ending now, will be beyond conception. People who talk now of further retaliation and punishment either do not conceive of the suffering endured already or are heartless and unfeeling and wish to stay at home, out of danger, whilst the punishment is being inflicted. Grant, it would be Grant in June of 1865 who would place his career on the line to defend 
former Confederate officers on tr from trial. He knew that retribution was not the path to peace, but instead to bitterness, division, and more conflict. He faced down President Johnson on the matter, threatening resignation, causing Johnson to back down. Many in the South, including General Lee, would not forget this honorable gesture of peace. Grant clearly saw his foes in a compassion as he shared his views with Secretary of War Stanton in June. He said, my opinion was firmly fixed long before the honor of commanding all our armies had been conferred on me, that no peace could be had that would be stable or conducive to the happiness of North and South until the military power of the rebellion was entirely broken. And this is, this is him saying this again. Believing us to be one people, one blood, and with identical interests, I do, I do and have felt the same interest in the ultimate welfare of the South as of the North. These views have been kept constantly before me and orders given and campaigns made to carry them out. How well it has been done is for the public who have to mourn the loss of friends who have fallen in the execution and to pay the expense, pecuniary cost of all this to say. All I can say is the work has been done conscientiously and to the best of my ability. It has been done in what I conceive to be the interest of the whole country, North and South. Let them hope a long peace and future harmony with that enemy whose manhood, however mistaken their cause, drew forth such Herculean deeds of valor. The wisdom of Aristotle proved all too true in the tumultuous days of Reconstruction ahead. He said, it is not enough to win a war, it is more important to organize the peace. Grant would have the tremendous responsibility of negotiating the military occupation of the South in the years, in the volatile years after the war. He would fi face violence against recently freed slaves as they sought to exercise their new freedoms. He knew true peace required equality, which he committed himself to. In May of 1868, Grant accepted the presidential nomination, something he had never sought. He accepted it out of a sense of duty alone and a concern over what may happen under an unfit president. Grant was not going to allow what had been gained through the thousands of deaths, the sacrifice of war, to be forfeited. He would see that the new birth of freedom and peace would be maintained. He responded to the nomination putting four words at the end of his letter that would come to symbolize the truest desire of his heart. If it elected to the office of the President of the United States, I will, it will be my endeavor to administer all the laws in good faith with economy and with the view of giving peace, quiet, and protection everywhere. Peace and universal prosperity with economy of administration will lighten the burden of taxation while it constantly reduces the national debt. Let us have peace. He knew progress came from peace. In his quest to reestablish a peaceful nation, Grant would be left, he left behind the battlefields of war for the battlefields of political partisanship and civil unrest. And these proved to be more insidious and difficult to address for a man trained in war, not politics. Many in the South resisted Reconstruction, especially the acceptance of African American rights. This led to the establishment of white leagues, as we know, and the famous clan whose members terrorized freed blacks and their supporters. Grant watched a different style of war, of war emerge, domestic terrorism. And this certainly had no place in a peaceful nation. Grant made his position clear in a letter addressing his supposed anti-Semitism, stating, I have no prejudice against sect or race, but want each individual to be judged by his own merit. In his inaugural address in 1869, he made a pledge to protect the citizens regardless of their color. On assuming my, the responsibilities and duties of Chief Magistrate of the United States, it was with the conviction that essential to its peace, prosperity, and fullest development it is, is to secure the protection of person and property of the citizens of the United States in each and every portion of our common country, whatever he may choose to move, without reference to original nationality, religion, color, or politics. 
he identified one of the biggest factors working against a unified nation. The present difficulty, he said, in bringing all parts of the United States to a happy unity and love of country grows out of the prejudice to color. The prejudice is a senseless one, but it exists. Us versus them. It continues to today. Grant would use federal authority during his administration to disrupt and disband the Klan, thereby, thereby protecting the lives of thousands of Americans. And although his measures only worked temporarily, Grant's efforts would set the stage for later civil rights measures. Foreign relations would pose another major threat to the peace of the United States during his administration. He inherited a dispute with Britain over naval issues. And in order to settle these disputes, he employed international arbitration, which became a powerful precedent for further peaceful resolutions on the international stage. Eventually, these efforts would culminate in what we now know as the United Nations. He would also hold out for a diplomatic resolution when faced with potential war with Spain over Cuba. Grant had seen enough of war, and true to his word, would seek any alternative. Grant highlighted the potential effects of successful arbitration towards world peace in his message to Congress. The relations of the United States with foreign powers continue to be friendly. This year has been an eventful one in witnessing two great nations settling by peaceful arbitration disputes of long standing and liable at any time to bring those nations into bloody and costly conflict. An example has thus been set which, if successful in its final issue, may be followed by other civilized nations and finally be the means of returning to productive industry millions of men now maintain to settle disputes of nations by the bayonet and the broadside. Education was also important. He championed universal education. He said, we are a republic where all should be possessed of education and intelligence enough to cast a vote with a right understanding of its meaning. The education of the masses becomes of the first necessity for the preservation of our institutions. They are worth preserving because they have secured the greatest good to the greatest proportion of the population of any government yet devised. An educated electorate is not going to be fooled. In his second inaugural address in 1873, Grant would share his vision for world unity and peace, saying, I believe, this is a very strong statement, I believe that our great maker is preparing for the world, or, I'm sorry, is preparing the world in his own good time to become one nation, speaking one language, and when armies and navies will be no longer required. Maybe this is pie in the sky, but this was the man's heart. He wanted to see a peaceful world. His vision, of course, it spread to all people in the land, including what he called the original inhabitants of the land, the Native Americans. They had been almost at perpetual conflict with the U.S. government for hundreds of years. Instead of fear, Grant had compassion for the Indians. As an early officer in the West Coast in the 1850s, he saw the true issue stating, it, really, it is really my opinion that the whole race would be harmless and peaceable if they were not put upon by the whites. So he saw what was going on already. And he stated it clearly that it was just as much the white man's fault as the Indian for their predicament. Any expense or course that will preserve the peace with the Indians is to be commended, he told General Sherman. Grant saw the dark side of human nature in the treatments of the Indians stating a system which looks to the extinction of a race is too horrible for a nation to adopt. He knew respect and dignity for all fellow humans was a hallmark of peace. As President Grant decided to take bold actions to try to establish a peace path for the Native Americans to become U.S. citizens, he worked with his former staff member, a Seneca Indian himself, Ely Parker, to craft a plan later termed the Indian Peace Policy to protect and establish a lasting peace with them. He stood firm on his reasoning. I recommend liberal appropriations to carry out the Indian peace policy, not only because it is humane, Christian-like, and economical, but because it is right. 
President Grant asked the people for support for his peace policy, knowing the public will was needed to make any of these things successful in achieving a peace. Of course, he encountered setbacks. The public was not ready to accept Native Americans and others, but he did everything he could to move it forward. He had championed peace for his nation through two difficult terms, and on his world tour that followed, now even though he was the next president now, he engaged in diplomacy on, the behalf, on behalf of his nation. As I mentioned, we'll be having Mary Stockwell come in October, so you're going to want to see that. She's going to get into more detail about what, we just, what I just mentioned. But as I go into uh, mentioning a little bit about Grant's world tour at the end of his life, there's also a book called Citizen of a Wider Commonwealth, Ulysses S. Grant's Prose Presidential Diplomacy. It sounds boring, but it's actually good. Uh, so <laughs> it's not the snazzy name that you usually get. But this is a great study on those few couple of years where Grant ran around the world and shared his vision for world peace and how to attain it especially through international arbitration. He spread these ideas around the world, and especially to Japanese and Chinese leaders, because they had an active dispute over an island. And to Prince Kung of China, he said, an arbitration between nations may not satisfy either party at the time, but it satisfies the conscience of the world and must commend itself more and more as a means of adjusting disputes. That's a global mentality in a time when you didn't have that uh, very often. That's a global mentality. Grant is ahead of his time, I believe, with this thinking. He returned to the U.S. in 1879 with a renewed sense of hope, stating to a veterans convention in September of 1879, they will submit to just and fair arbitration rather than fight. And when a grand people asks for nothing but what is just and fair from other nations, I think we have a promise of a long period of peace and prosperity prosperity, such as was never known to the civilized world before. In December, at a convention with the Universal Peace Society, which included notables such as Lucretia Mott, Clara Barton, and the first Nobel Peace Prize recipient, Frederick Posse, Grant stated his hopes for world peace. My views on the subject of universal peace and the resort to conflict, to the conflict of arms, have been well known, having been made public in an official way. Although educated and brought up as a soldier, and having probably seen as many battles as anyone, there was never a time or a day when it was not my desire that some just and fair way should be established for settling difficulties. Instead of bringing innocent persons into the conflict and thus withdrawing from productive labor able-bodied men who in a large majority of cases have no particular interest in the subject for what they are, which, which they are contending, I look forward to a day when there will be a court established that shall be recognized by all nations, which will take into consideration all questions of differences between nations and settle by arbitration or decision of such court those questions instead of keeping up large standing armies as in Europe. In the course of my travels, from what I have seen, I am constrained to believe, however, that the day is yet distant when such a result may be hoped for. So he was being realistic. Each nation is jealous over the advance made by others in that direction and the, in the acquisition of territory, establishment of commercial relations. I did not think, however, though, that this should be any cause for abatement on the part of the Universal Peace Society, that they, what they look forward to is a great reform, and such reforms are never accomplished in a day. I only wish it was susceptible of a speedy resolution, but as I remarked, I do not think it is. The aptly named president of the society, Alfred H. Love, lauded Grant's eminent civil services for peace and sought his support for an international court of arbitration. May we not, he's, this is love, he says, may we not hope from the past that you will do, still do more for peace and, uh, and make war and indeed the military system so unpopular that they may be developed, there may be developed a higher civilization and grander republican idea of reliance upon reason and the Christian principles of peace rather than the barbarous custom of deadly force. Grant received a drawing of Lucretia Mott, who was unable to attend, stating, The life and history of Lucretia Mott are well known in this country, as well as abroad. I have had the pleasure of meeting her and appreciate her devotion to the cause of peace very highly. The Peace Society was established in 1866, and it would continue to 1913, and per pursuing peace through the advancement of equal rights, labor reforms, universal suffrage, and, and, and especially international arbitration. And Grant would enjoy a few peaceful years with his family before tragedy stuck. And as you know, losing all his money, he was forced to write his memoirs in a desperate bid to provide for his family. 
while struggling against terminal t t uh, cancer. He would know no real peace in the final months, but his endless devotion to his family drove him on. His deep desire to see his nation healed and to become re re reunited seemed to be coming true in his final months. He wrote on a slip of paper, My expected death has called forth expressions of kindness from all the people of all the sections of this country. It looks as if my sickness has had something to do to bring about harmony between the sections. It has been an inestimable blessing to me to hear the kind expressions towards me in person from all parts of the country, from people of all nationalities, religions, Confederate and national troops alike, embracing almost every citizen in the land. They have brought joy to my heart. One of his final visitors here at Grant Cottage exemplified this. Simon Buckner, a former Confederate general. Buckner visited with Grant here in the house. He pledged his support, but also the support of the Confederate veterans. Grant saw all veterans of the war as Americans. He did not agree with their cause, but he saw them as Americans. He wanted the press to carry this story in the papers. He shared the following note that made it into the papers, and this is an excerpt. He said, I have witnessed since my sickness just what I have wished to see since the war, harmony and good feeling between the sections. I have always contended that if there had been nobody left but the soldiers, we would have had peace in a year. We may now well look forward to a perpetual peace at home and a national strength. And I think that was his hope, his final hope. He desired the messenger of peace to relieve him of his sufferings. After fulfilling his final duty to his family, Grant died peacefully, surrounded by his family in the parlor here. True signs of healing and respect would follow his passing as Confederates marched in his New York City funeral, and two of his pallbearers were former foes, Generals Buckner and Johnston. A true sign of unity and respect at the end. In his final sentiments in his memoirs, Grant showed his true hope for peace for his nation. I feel that we are on the eve of a new era, when there is to be great harmony between the Federal and Confederate. I cannot stay to be a living witness to the correctness of this prophecy, but I feel it within me that it is to be so. The universally kind feeling expressed for me at a time when it was supposed that each day would prove my last seemed to be, to me, the beginning of the answer to, let us have peace. When Grant's tomb was completed 12 years later, they chose a quote to be put on the facade, and it was truly the cry of this man's heart, an eternal reminder to all people, let us have peace. In the Bible, which Grant put a great emphasis on as a guide to, guide to life, it states in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, Live peaceably with all men. Peace is not just something that happens. It's an attitude, a demeanor, something that is remembered and practiced in daily life. It is in the way we look at each other, in the way we act toward each other. It's laying hold of something larger than ourselves and setting that as a priority in our lives, leaving our pettiness behind for the greater good. Grant held a hope and faith in a better future for humanity, established on peace. He knew that good, the good and bad elements of human nature and had an abiding, abiding trust in humankind's ability to live in peace and harmony. After witnessing the immense horror and sadness of war, he knew there was a better way. Though I have been trained as a soldier and participated in many battles, there was never a time, in my opinion, some way could not be found to prevent the drawing of the sword. And he repeated, I look forward to an epoch when a court recognized by all nations will settle, settle international differences instead of keeping large standing armies. This dream would become a reality. We now have courts, international courts. We now have the United Nations and other organizations. And nonprofit organizations that work towards world peace. There is still much conflict and violence 
in this world, but everyone can p play a part. Now, I'd like to invite everyone. Does anyone have any questions before? Any questions or comments? Okay, we're, we're going to have a ceremony, and you can choose to be part of it or not. That's fine. Um, it will require a little bit of walking. We're going to go to the Overlook uh, to do this. It's going to be a peace ceremony. Uh, basically, um, we're going to stand in solidarity with the others uh, around the world. There's probably at least 130 nations today that have peace ceremonies, uh, and we're going to stand in solidarity. Uh, so we're going to walk to the Overlook, um, and that's going to represent our desire uh, to, to achieve peace. Uh, and when we, when we go down there, we'll, I'll make a couple of comments. Um, we'll ring the peace bell here. Uh, there is a, a large peace bell that is uh, used by the UN uh, to mark this occasion. We'll use this bell and we also have some candles we'll pass out there and we'll have a moment of silence down there um, to remember all those that have championed peace uh, throughout the years, including uh, General Grant. Um, so if you'd like to take that walk with us, uh, we'd love to have you. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming to the presentation today. Thank you. Alrighty, so, alrighty, so we're going we're gonna to ring this bell in solidarity with the bell that is, is being rung today around the world. It's going to be a symbol of our desire for world peace, our desire to end violence and conflict in this world. And we know that it starts with us and what we can do to be part of it. But it, it also has everything to do with the way that we regard each other and how we regard the rest of the world. So we're all part of the human race and we're all in this ship together. And I think that's, if we can stand on that foundation, world peace could, can be a reality. And I think Grant desired that. I think the men who fell in the wars have all desired peace. They desired to go back to their families in a peaceful time. In a way, they were all fighting for peace. And so we recognize them, and we recognize all those who have come before us that have desired peace. Some of them have lost their lives in their efforts for peace. And we recognize them today with a moment of silence. Now, if you'll stand, we'll be taking a photo of everyone. I can imagine it probably warmed Grant's heart to see this peaceful valley here of farmers in the three days before he died. And we get to look out on the same peaceful, the same peaceful valley because of the efforts of him and countless other soldiers to keep us united to avoid war here in our country.